just ran out back and grabbed another cable because I thought we should talk about this cable as well, um, which of course uh, meant that I wasn't standing here when the timer ran out. Um, so thanks for coming to Resource Stage tonight. Tonight, uh, sorry, I'm Carl, and welcome to Horizon. <laughs> I think I've, I know everybody here. I've met everybody here at least once. Um, and tonight we are talking about digital video transport, or the means of sending video over some sort of cable to get it from one point to another point. Uh, back a number of years ago, we used to use things like coax video for sending, sending uh, coax cable for running video over a distance, or we would use VGA. Remember that VGA connector, that 15 pin sort connector that was used for all kinds of things? Before that, there was uh, the CGA connector, which was a nine pin, I guess. And uh, the idea of that VGA connector, which then of course also became XGA, uh, had the ability to do way more, uh, way higher resolution, way more bandwidth, and you could do all kinds of interesting thing with things with that. And we still have some clients who are running VGA and they're using that protocol for, uh, protocol, it's not even really a protocol, I guess it is, it is a protocol, for, for running video in their churches and, and some schools. Uh, what I always think it's interesting when you go into the bank and you see that in the back of a lot of the monitors in the bank are old VGA cables because they roll out one technology to all of the different branches and then they stick with it for a long, long time. Well, thankfully, and not thankfully, <laughs> we are beyond all of that analog video now, and we're into a much different digital age of video. You know, back then, it was fairly easy to figure some things out because an analog video cable, you would plug it into the, the source uh, device, computer, or what have you, and the output of that was analog which meant that it was actually, you know, a, a power signal being sent out, and the further you got away, then the signal would, would degrade. Well, you could, at 50 feet, 100 feet, 200 feet, whatever, you could put in some sort of an amplifier to amplify that signal, and then it would resend it. Now, here's the thing to keep in mind, is that as soon as you're getting out of the computer, then it's starting to degrade. So you're re rebuilding a signal. You're amplifying something that's already not perfect. So we have had lots of clients in the past who have VGA systems where we might have run a 100, cab 100 foot cable, 200 foot cable, whatever, to get to the projectors or other displays. And that is going such a distance and now we're amplifying it and it's looking a little soft in the edges. And, and here, here's an interesting thing. You know, a lot of people think well, VGA, we could only get up to a certain resolution. The truth is, is that on VGA, you can actually get to pretty high resolutions. You can get to, to the equivalent of a 1080p image, but it could be very soft. So, thankfully, um, we came to some other protocols. So we're gonna run through a bunch of this stuff tonight. And as far as how fast we go tonight is somewhat up to you guys. And if you are watching uh, online and you've got questions, then feel free to ask. And Logan is m uh, watching the chat tonight, so you can ask uh, any of your questions there, and we will try to try to answer those. Um, so there are five different protocols we're going to talk about tonight, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that covers everything. In fact, I'm going to tell you right off the bat that's not going to cover everything. And there's a number of other ones, but we're, we're just like, a, I'll tell you right off, <laughs> right off the bat, we're not going to talk about display ports so much. We're also not going to talk about USB-C, which is a whole can of worms. Maybe I'll touch base on that a little bit um, at the end here. We're also not going to talk about all of the different variations on HDMI or, di or display port that Apple has put out over the years and how they've done all kinds of weird and wonderful things with that and then called it their own. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to try to stick to these five things, to DVI, HDMI, SDI, HDBase-T, and AV over IP, or in this case, we're going to talk specifically about NDI. And if you've got other questions about any of the other sorts of di digital signals out there, then we'll try to answer them. 
I would be lying if I tried to tell you that I am an expert in all things digital video. Um, that's just not the case. I think most people who would suggest they are an expert are lying to themselves first <laughs> and then lying to you <laughs> because it gets complicated and there's a lot of different nuances to things and something I'm going to show you tonight how something might work one way and you think oh yeah it's working and then you you do one thing and then everything crashes and it stops working okay <laughs> so <clears throat> excuse me um, we have five different types of protocols here that we're going to go through and uh, and try to explain so hopefully uh, we'll see how we do here we need to start with one thing excuse me we need to start with talking about resolutions so video is um, is typically we talk about we talk about different types of resolutions so uh, the display that we're looking at here is a is a 4k display so this uh, this is actually a pretty good um, example for you if you took take a look in the top right hand corner there that is what your old standard definition television would have been producing now this says 480p but the truth is is that it was probably a 480i um, display at home if you were using a display for watching or for uh, you know on your Commodore 64 that would have been a 480 um, display and that would be 4 by 3 ratio okay so for every four inches wide, you're three inches tall, that kind of a thing, okay? And it's 640 pixels per inch by 480, er, 480 pixels. The next step after that was 720p, and we all thought that 720p was awesome, it was great, we were, all, we were very happy with this, it was very cool because we're getting into a 16 by nine widescreen display, and that worked out pretty well. And it actually, you know, we don't have it on here, but when people were using XGA, that resolution, that re resolution was actually uh, 1024 by 768. Is that right? Yep, 1024 by 768. So 1280 by 720 is actually kind of the 16 by 9 version of that. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, from there, we went up to full HD. Okay, so what everybody refers to now as just 1080p, okay, and that is 1920 by 1080 in a 16 by 9 format, okay. There is this other funky one in there, the 16 by 10 format, and I don't, do you guys ever see 16 by 10? Yeah, maybe? So 16 by 10 is interesting because uh, that that ratio is typically used for computers for a long time actually many you had to look specifically for a computer monitor that was 16 by 9 back a number of years ago or a few years ago now all computer monitors were more like a 16 by 10 unless you were specifically looking for one for doing video editing and then uh, a lot of projectors were 16 by 10 in fact interesting enough we're finding that many professional uh, projector manufacturers are actually moving away from a 16 by 9 projector ratio and they're only producing 16 by 10 with the idea that you can always make a 16 by 10 projector look like a 16 by 9 projector but it's hard to go the other way around if that makes any sense okay um, 16 by 10 is essentially a taller image it is an image with more pixels in the the uh, vertical okay so that is uh, 1080p, then we jump to Quad HD, which is this kind of funny one. We do see this a lot in, uh, in computer monitors. So it's kind of that step in between. And then we jump all the way up to 4K. So it is quite the step between 4K and 1080p when you take a look at this. It's also quite the step between 720p and 1080p. It's a lot of real estate between the difference there. And it's also, um, if it's the same size display, then there's a whole lot more um, pixels that are filling in. Okay? Why does that matter? We're going to talk about that in a second. Okay? So are we good there? Does everybody understand? We've got different resolutions, right? Okay. So whenever you take a look at these things, you're often going to see something like, uh, it doesn't show it on this chart, 
but you're often going to see a number behind the resolution. So everything that we're talking about tonight, you're going to see a number that might be a 30, might be a 60. If you are a gamer, you might be trying to buy a monitor that's a minimum of 120 hertz, okay, that kind of a thing. And that number means something. So there's two different numbers we need to talk about. And the first one is frame rate. And uh, I've been kind of looking around all over the place for, for material for tonight. And I've been trying to make sure that I'm, I'm uh, properly uh, uh, explaining where those sources came from. This one tonight, this came from the Adobe website. It says, frame rate is the measurement of how quickly a number of frames appear within a second. That's why it's called frames per second. Okay, So that's how many times the frame appears in a video. So this is the source material. Does that make sense? So the frames per second is how quickly that camera, the video that's being captured on the camera, is actually capturing that video. Okay. So then, what is refresh rate? So refresh rate, according to intel.com, and they know something about this kind of thing, the refresh rate of your display refers to how many times per second the display is able to draw a new image. This is measured in hertz. Do you see the difference? No, okay. <laughs> so let's go back to the other one. Frame rate is measured in how quickly a number of frames appear per second. So that is how fast it's being produced okay, from the camera or from the computer, right, from the content. And the refresh rate is the rate that the display is producing that. Okay? So it seems to me that the refresh rate has to do with the hardware side of things my monitor has a refresh rate in X number of hertz. This one's probably 60 hertz, okay? These monitors are definitely not gonna be any better than 60 hertz. I'd be surprised if they're any better than 60 hertz, okay? But the video that we are capturing tonight, Matthew, the video we're capturing tonight is all in 60 hertz, is that right? Uh, or 60 frames per second, I should say? No, no what, are, what are we capturing in? One one twenty. Okay, so we're just gonna we're gonna mess around with things. So it's it's in one twenty then. That's what you're saying. Oh, okay, great. Well, we're not gonna talk about that tonight because that's not helpful for us. But we're gonna call it sixty for all all intents and purposes. Okay. So basically, what's happening is is that the display end of things, how fast it's generating that image. Okay is going to be hertz, that's that refresh rate, and the frame rate is what the content's being produced. Okay? Is that making sense? Here's the thing. You need to make sure those two things are, are coordinating. Okay? Because otherwise you can run into some problems. That's not to say that it won't work. That's to say it's not you're not going to get the best video quality. And sometimes it won't work. Okay? So, we talked about resolution. We talked about frame rate, and we talked about uh, refresh rate. Why does it matter? It all comes down to bandwidth and compatibility. On the bandwidth side of things, bandwidth is how much capacity does this transport technology have to be able to send that information through. Okay, so. Sometimes companies like to say things like, do you have enough bandwidth to be able to do this job? And basically what they mean is, do you have enough employees and the time to be able to do it? Well, it's the same sort of thing. It's, does the transport technology that you're using to get that signal from here to here, can it support what you're trying to push down, down the line? Is that making sense? Cool. The bandwidth that is required to produce some video or to be able to do any of this is going to be dictated. The amount of, of bandwidth that you're taking up 
is going to be taken uh, is going to be dictated by how much information you're passing through and the amount of information is going to be a result of the resolution and that frame rate okay I don't have a calculation up here we actually I did I was actually looking at using a calculator for tonight and I thought that's gonna take us on a bunny trail that is that could take hours so we're not going to talk about that tonight but that's how those two things go together to come up with what you can do so why does that matter well any of the technologies we're talking about tonight the manufacturers who came up with that or the group of people who came up with that technology had to make a decision they had to decide all right how are we going to build this technology and how how are we going to make sure that we can get the highest resolution with the with the the highest frame rate with the best color depth which we're not going to talk about tonight because that's a whole other can of worms there's a lot of things we're not going to talk about tonight this is the thing about about digital video but how are we going to be able to do that where are we going to set the limits because they're creating a technology and they need to decide well what's our upper limit what's our lower limit that kind of thing and they each had to make those decisions and over time they've each made changes to that so let's start talking about DVI is everybody familiar with DVI that connector there has a whole whack load of pins on it right it looks kind of like a big wide VGA connector and it's interesting that it looks like that because in a way that's kind of what it was when it first came out DVI is actually in a lot of ways the most interesting of all of these different technologies because it was designed in a really great way to be a bridge connector and technology that got us from <laughs> from digital to analog that's wrong from analog to digital I don't know what I was thinking when I typed that this connector combines both analog VGA and digital video into the same connector some of the pins on a DVI on a full-size DVI connector some of those pins are actually analog VGA and some of those pins are digital video does that make sense okay there have been times when some people have been confused and they thought well okay but that must mean that DVI doesn't carry audio because VGA didn't carry audio VGA was a video graphics adapter only that's all it did but DVI did incorporate audio on the digital side so you can use a DVI connector and have it transport video and audio on the digital side of things Does that make sense sometimes you will see a DVI connector that has less pins and depending on which pins are missing it may not do the analog video thing the VGA thing or it might not do the digital side I haven't seen too many that don't do the digital side for the most part they all do that okay the advantages to to a DVI connector is that it's it's robust it has those little screws to be able to screw it onto the piece of equipment or on the back of your computer and we actually just even uh, last week we had an order for a number of DVI connectors for a client using them in an industrial application because it's still a good um, component for being able to get good quality video and lock it on there so it's not going to just fall off okay does that make sense great um, so when it comes to resolution the latest version of DVI in a dual link con connector will actually do uh, 2560 by 1600 in a dual link style connector we don't actually see a lot of dual link around so most of these actually max out kind of around 1080p um, a lot of people aren't using DVI for more than 1080p okay and if you are watching this video and you are you find something online and you say Carl you're wrong go ahead and send me an email because I'd love to hear where I'm wrong tonight there's a whole bunch of different pieces of information here I'm hoping I'm getting them all right okay one of the other important things to keep in mind about DVI is that if you're using the video sorry the digital video side it maxes out at 50 feet. 
Okay. On the analog side, you can use it just like you can use VGA, which you can get up to 200 feet maybe before things start to get pretty messy. But on the digital side, it can only go so far. All right, is this making sense? Cool. So next connector. Oh, I should say, DVI was put together by a specific group. Can't remember the name right now. Digital something solu video solutions or something. And they were put together, and a lot of people d adopted that. HDMI is a different animal. There's some things you can tell about HDMI right off the bat that's different than DVI. The first thing that you can notice about HDMI is you see the logo there? See how it's got a trademark signal, symbol, signal, symbol on it? That means somebody's out to make money. <laughs> the HDMI technology is actually borrowed from DVI. So what happened was, is this group of companies got together, Hitachi, Panasonic, Philips, Silicon Image, Sony, Thompson, who is actually, uh, I believe, owns RCA these days, and Toshiba, and they all got together and they created a company, not, not a company, sorry, a group, and they created HDMI the high definition multimedia interface. And what they were looking to do back in 2002 is they were looking for a way to create a digital signal that they could use to go from that DVD player, that newfangled DVD player into a TV with the best quality possible. And when they did that, they were actually in the beginning, they actually could only get to, I think it was uh, maybe 1080i, I think, is what they started out as. And then over time, they worked on that, and they got it to the point now where we can get up to uh, a basic 8K with HDMI. Well, the making money part, if you Google it, take a look, if you want to put an HDMI connector on your piece of hardware, that costs you $10,000 US per year if you're making 10,000 pieces or more. It costs you $7,000 a year US plus I think it's something like a dollar for every piece of equipment that you sell up to that 10,000 pieces. And then there's if you want to use the logo they charge you, if you want to do this and that. So sometimes when you look at a piece and you look at it and go, why does that have a DVI connector on it instead of HDMI? Well, you can buy the DVI device and it doesn't have any cost to it. And then you can use an adapter from DVI to HDMI and it didn't cost them anything. Now, if you're going to the more advanced HDMI pieces that, are, uh, that have diverged from DVI, then you may not get it. Like for instance, if you want to get up to 8K um, video over your HDMI, you're not going to get that out of a DVI. Is this making sense? All right. Um, so what they were doing, what this group was doing, is they were trying to build a replacement for DVI, and they were trying to take that computer technology and move it into consumer video. As I said, to go from, it was all about getting from the DVD player to your TV. It was all about getting from, you know, Sony was in there. Sony wanted to get from PlayStation to the TV. Toshiba, they wanted to get from the, Blu-ray player, or at the time, DVD player to the TV, to their TVs. They wanted it to look really great. All of these guys, they all had a vested interest in making this work. We're going to come back to the vested interest thing in a couple of minutes. Okay? Um, in September 2013, they got to HDMI 2.0, which got them up to 4K 60, and today, like I said, we're up into the 8K sort of range. I think the I think it's we're up to 8K 30, and we might be up to 8K 60 now. But again, we have this limitation of 50 feet max. Now, this is about the time when I say 50 feet max that somebody opens another tab window in their browser, and they go to Amazon and they go HDMI cable 100 foot and they find something on Amazon. Just because you can find it on the internet doesn't mean that that's, <laughs> that's gonna work. There's lots of things out there that can, uh, can look like that's what they're gonna do, but they're not going to do it 
to its full bandwidth or to its full capabilities. So you may find a 100 foot HDMI cable out there, but it might only do 720p. Okay? The whole distance thing is about how much bandwidth you can pass over that distance. And when HDMI says, when the HDMI group says, we can get you up to this distance, they're saying we can guarantee that if you're using this cable that meets the HDMI 2.0 or above spec, then you are going to be able to get to this resolution within this limit. So it's not to say that it can't happen, it's just to say you're not going to be able to get to the full extent. There are some other interesting technologies that are floating around with HDMI that can get you to a, an interesting next step. Things like HDMI cables that are built with optical cable. HDMI cables that are active cables that are actually regenerating the signal and boosting the, the signal. There's HDMI cables that are flat cable, which is kind of an interesting piece. A real pain in the neck to roll up. Because if you've ever worked with flat cable, it's a mess. <laughs> it comes in a really nice box, and then when you start to unroll it, it's it's like it's like a fruit roll up, only a hundred feet. You try to roll that back up again, it's never going back in the box, right? I don't know what fruit roll up. I don't know why you'd put it back in the box. Anyway, um, so there are different technologies, and the whole flat cable thing has to do with crosstalk between the different wires and so on and so forth. And you're able to get further. It does work. It's a whole other discussion. But anyway, um, for the most part, we're going to say. HDMI reliably no more than 50 feet. If you go back to why it is that they created HDMI, they had no reason to be concerned about going past 50 feet. Who has their DVD player further than 50 feet away from their TV? Even if you, they looked at some of their consumer sort of applications, like you walk through the mall and you see some sort of media player playing something on a TV it's usually within a fairly close distance, within one store. But when you start to look at some of the applications we work in, in theaters, in churches, in larger retail applications, in universities where we're sending video across campuses, that kind of thing, then at that point, then 50 feet becomes a bigger problem. Okay? All right. Are we ready for SDI? Okay. Okay. SDI has been around for 89, say 89 years, for since 1989, 18, <laughs> let me start again. SDI has been around since 1989, okay? Um, it started out as a broadcast grade video uh, product. And I've got a slide here that's going to help me here. SDI, standard SDI started out in... 89 at 480i. They upgraded a year later, sorry, a year later, 11 years later to 480p. Okay, so we went from an interlaced video signal to a progressive signal. We're not going to talk about the difference there because for the most part interlaced doesn't matter anymore because pretty much nobody does anything with interlaced anymore. For the most part. I'm being very broad strokey sort of stuff tonight. HD SDI, which is up to 720p, was um, actually came out um, before and before the ED SDI, and then we get into this funky thing called dual link HD SDI. So that is actually the ability to take two HD SDI lines and put them in parallel to get to 1080p. There's a number of different pieces of technology out there over the years that have used this kind of a concept of running two different lines side by side. The problem is, is that this cable was built this day and this cable was built this day. This cable is a little longer, this cable is a little shorter. This cable is whatever. This connector's terminated right, this one's not. And you can end up with these funky things. Thankfully, we don't see dual link pretty much anywhere anymore. Because 3G SDI came out in 2006, which is 1080p, which can now do 1080p 60, and then we have uh, 6G SDI, which we hardly ever see, 
12 GSDI, which we see pretty regularly, and then 24 GSDI, which we, I don't think we've ever done an installation with 24 at Horizon. Okay. Um, the idea of SDI is interesting. If you can see it there on the picture, and I've got an SDI cable right here. An SDI cable looks like a, it's just got a BNC connector on it. It's a 75 ohm cable. Yeah. Are the terms SDI and BNC, are the cables? Okay. Well, I just actually picked up the cable. So this is an interesting concept. So before I, I answer that, let me, let me back up for a second. If I have a pair of headphones, the jack on my pair of headphones that I plug into a mixer, or I plug into my old stereo or whatever, is a quarter inch jack, okay? The jack that comes out of my guitar is a quarter inch jack. The connector I use to go into my old monitor speaker on stage is a quarter inch jack. All three of those are completely different applications, but they're using a quarter inch jack. They're all using that same sort of, of connector. It's just using the connector and the connector is its own thing separate from the technology. Is that making sense? Okay. BNC is a type of connector. Please don't ask me to tell you what BNC means. I knew it at one point. Oh, we have a, we have a, uh, do you remember it? <laughs> okay, Matthew, what? here, hold on a second, Matthew. I'm gonna throw you this. Thank you. You just dropped the microphone. Okay. <laughs> Yes, sorry. Okay, yes. So BNC is derived from a chain network connector. It's a, it's a chain network connector. Right. Right. Well, there you go. Perfect. All right. Thank you very much. So BNC connectors are used for all kinds of different things. They're used for video. They're used for antennas. We use, they're, an, they're antennas on wireless microphones, in-ear monitors, all kinds of stuff like that all over the place. They are used on old video, they're used for, for, uh, for new video, they're used for all kinds of things. So BNC is the type of connector, SDI is the technology. And unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, if you pick up a cable that was originally designed to work with, S, uh, H, sorry, with SD, SDI back in 89, it could look exactly the same as a cable from today. It has to do with the type of cable it is and whether or not that cable is capable of sending the bandwidth of, of what's uh, uh, being sent, okay? So, um, so I guess that was a long way to say that BNC and SDI are not the same things. SDI is the technology that is passed down the cable and it's using a BNC connector on the end of it. Does that sound fair? All right, great. Um, we do have some situations where somebody will take a cable and they will say, well, this is an old SDI, or sorry, an old uh, BNC video line that was originally installed for use for coax video, and they will try sending SDI down that, video, down that line. We've seen actually uh, the infrastructure that was installed in some universities and some different applications where they had that and they've said, we're gonna give this a go, and it's worked up to a point um, based on the resolution that they're trying to hit and the distance that they're trying to go, okay? Um, there are some interesting gotchas with SDI. Do you remember that I said that this is a broadcast cable? If this is a broadcast cable, then it is going to work for only for 16 by 9 video. Because television and broadcast is all in that sort of, of format. Now, I say 16 9, but what I mean by that is that SDI is really designed to only work with resolutions that are in that 16 by 9 format. 1080p, 4K, 720p, that kind of a thing. Okay, now, 
It will work depending on what type of devices you're you're working with. It will work at uh, 1080 60, 1080 30, 1080 59 94, that kind of thing. It'll work at different refresh rates, but it will only work with that. If you are trying to send a 16 by 10 signal down SDI, it will not work. Okay? That's a troubleshooting tip. We have situations sometimes where somebody is trying to send video from their computer to a projector. The projector is 16 by 10, their video screen is 16 by 10. They're wondering, why is my image squished? That's why your image is squished. And you can fight with it all day long and play with the resolution settings and complain about, I should have bought a Mac instead of a PC, or I don't like this Intel video card. Maybe that's just me. But you can continue to argue about that kind of stuff, but at the end of the day, it's the technology you're using, it's not all the other pieces, okay? All right. One of the nice things about it is that it is designed to go a distance. If you use the right cable that meets the spec for uh, 3G SDI, uh, 12G SDI, whatever it might be, if you use the right cable, then you should be able to get approximately 300 feet out of SDI at the resolutions that it's rated for. Okay, which is pretty cool. That's uh, that's really great. And you know, I've got in here that it is designed for function. It's a nice cable in that it locks on. You can get fairly rubberized sort of cable, which is not necessarily like a microphone cable, but it's still free, pretty flexible. I can do different things with it. And it's pretty robust. It's designed to go from cameras out to the camera truck, that kind of a thing. All right, are we good? I got a little note on there. There's a little note at the bottom. It says, not HDCP compatible. If you've never heard of HDCP before, we're going to talk about that in a second. But first, we're going to get past the next two technologies, OK? Sound good? All right, moving right along. HD base T. HD base T is, is essentially like sending an HDMI signal over a category cable. Now, I was about to say Cat5 cable, but the truth is that these days we hardly ever run it over Cat5. If you go to the HDBase-T Alliance's website, they will tell you that you can run it over Cat5. We disagree. <laughs> I mean, they've created the technology. We get it. That's what they say is their minimum spec. And, and they have specific cables that they say are made to work with that, and that's fine. We, for the most part, have found that running HD base T over a category six cable that is shielded is by far the best way to, to do this with the, the least amount of headaches. What happens, I, I have HD base T transmitter receivers here that, um, that our folks have set up here, but they're all kind of wired, so I can't, I can't just grab one and show you. But essentially, it's HDMI input and then a Cat5 cable output. In our rental inventory, we often run a cable that looks like this. From the outside, it looks like a, an XLR cable. On the inside, that's actually an RJ45 connector. We do this in rentals because that saves that connector. Okay, Because the if you can see it in the picture, that looks like a regular uh, RJ45 connector, right? It looks like it. It's actually a shielded connector, so that if you're using a shielded cable, then it carries that shield through. It's a pretty expensive connector. Like most RJ45 connectors, you're paying like 35, 75 cents, maybe a buck a piece if you're buying something fancy. These connectors are more like six, eight dollars a piece. They're they're a bit of a different animal. But if you just leave it like that without some sort of a shield over top, or without some sort of a, a shell over top of it, then it's easy for it to get broken in applications like in our rental inventory. So we will often use them with that, that sort of EtherCon connector. EtherCon is actually a copyright um, name by Nutrick, the guys who make most XLR connectors out there today. 
that's a whole other discussion. But um, yeah, it uh, suffice it to say that it is a shielded cat, uh, shielded R RJ45 connector, which we usually put on a Cat6 cable. Okay. This cable is a little. This technology is a little bit different because not only does it send video and audio, but it also sends power, Ethernet, network information, USB, and IR control. And the one I missed in there is RS-232 control as well. And it can send that all down one shielded CAT6 cable. The power side of that's kind of interesting. This is not, if you're familiar with uh, PoE, this is not actually PoE, although m many manufacturers of HD based T equipment, they will put in their specifications if they are PoE enabled or not. The truth is, is that it's actually a, a technology called POH, which is power over HD based T. Okay? It is not PoE, it is not the same voltage as PoE. But what's really kind of interesting is, is that when HD Base T first came out and it was first being shown at some of the big um, consumer shows in uh, Los Angeles, in Las Vegas, and in Europe, the manufacturers that are part of this were actually connecting a, uh, they were connecting peripherals from a, from a uh, one hub. So you would have your stereo and your stereo would have power it would plug into the wall because that's your amplifier and everything right and then you would use one cat 5 cable hd base t to go from there and it would power and sound video and send audio to your television and you could also expand it from there now the power end of things for powering up external devices never seem to go anywhere at least we haven't seen it go anywhere um, but that's used for transmitter and receiver situations. So an example would be, we will often have a transmitter mounted up at a projector, or sorry, a receiver mounted up a, a, at a projector. Well, the projector needs power, right? So there's definitely gonna be power at the projector. So we can plug the receiver box in at the projector, and then the transmitter that might be a wall plate the wall plate is getting its power from the transmitter. Does that make sense? Okay. And HD base T comes in a couple of different flavors. There's many different manufacturers out there. In theory, they should all uh, standardize to the HD base T standard. The one thing that's a little bit funky with HD base T is that each of the different manufacturers who implement it get to choose which pieces of the implementation they get into. So if they say, you know what? we only really want to implement these pieces of HD base T, they can ignore the other ones and still get designation that they're, they're using HD base T. So that could be that if you have one piece of equipment that says HD base T on it, it's got the logo, and you've got another one from another manufacturer that says HD base T, they will likely pass video and audio at the minimum spec, but that doesn't mean that, they, that you'll get all the other things from it, depending on what they've implemented. Does that make sense? Cool. Um, the highest version of HD Base T today does 4K 60 with Dolby Vision. As far as your display, projector, whatever, thinks, it believes that it is seeing an HDMI cable plugged between the two devices if it's all implemented, in, or it all implemented correctly. It shouldn't know any different. As far as it's concerned, it should think that it's within the, uh, the very close um, confines. HD base T is good for approximately 300 feet if you are using the right cable. We have done installations of 300 feet. We did one last week, the week before, um, and it's pushing the limits. You want to be careful about what, what sort of resolutions you're sending, but it can be done. Here's that HDCP thing again. We're building up to talking about that. HDBase-T is compliant. I said earlier on, SDI was not compliant. HDBase-T is. And as I said, it's virtually unseen by the, by the source in the display in that it doesn't know that you're using that as far as it thinks you're using just HDMI cable. Okay? Um, 
HDBase T is not a network protocol. It's just using the category cable to send the signal. You cannot put a network switch in between an HDBase T line. It will not work. Okay? It's just one of the many things that we have in this industry where we are using a different cable or connector for something else. Alrighty? Okay. Moving on. Okay, the next one is NDI. In my original si slide at the beginning, I said AV IP and NDI. AV over IP is a concept that if you go to any of the big trade shows and you go and you talk to many manufacturers in digital video, AV over IP is a very, very hot topic everywhere. Has been for a few years now. This is an example of one manufacturer. Uh, we have a couple of different manufacturers in the building um, tonight, but this is one example. This is a company called Just Add Power. And this technology is you have one box on one end, it is connecting into your, it's going to connect into your network, going to send HDMI in in one end, and then this box sits at your display, and it has HDMI out, and it's got uh, one gig LAN port on the other side. This can go and should go on a switch, and it's going to send video from this to this. More than that, I can send video from this to three of these. More than that, I can send video from two transmitters to four different receivers, and I can switch back and forth between them, depending on, on the network. So now I don't have a video switcher. Now I don't have a video matrix. It's all done with in the network control. We're controlling which of the packets of video information the receivers are paying attention to. This thing puts the video up onto the network. This thing decides which ones it's actually going to pay attention to and which ones it's going to decode into video. There's also some other interesting tricks you can do with this. You can do things like you can manipulate the video and let's say you had four of these and you could go to four different TVs. And those four different TVs, one's going to get the top left quadrant, one's going to get the top right quadrant, bottom left, bottom right, and you've created yourself a little video wall with four receivers and one, one transmitter. So kind of some funky things you can do. Most AV over IP technologies are proprietary. If you are going to use a receiver from Just Add Power, you are going to use a transmitter from Just Add Power. In order to get the latency as low as possible, the amount of frame loss, or not loss, sorry, the delay that's happening between the transmitter and the receiver, to keep that as low as possible, then you need to be working with the same manufacturer. That's what they're saying. They're saying in order for us to be able to control those packets and to keep things as tight as possible, that's what you're going to do. Okay, I'm going to keep waving these things around like this, and Sam at the back is taking funny pictures of me doing that. Okay, I'm going to put that down now. All right. So, oh, yes, Matthew, you have another question. Yeah. So we have a question from DG here asking if there's a recommendation for HD base the adapters. I think it's just asking about if there's a certain brand or that that we prefer in our installations. Right. Um, well, uh, we have had a ton of success over the years with Kramer, um, with Kramer HD base T converters, and we sell lots of those, and they've worked out really, really well. Um, actually, I was talking to a client yesterday and today, who we installed a system for them maybe eight or nine years ago. And there's actually a, an HD base T transmitter receiver from Kramer just died recently because they had a uh, they had a lightning situation or other power situation in the building. But other than that, for the most part, they're they're very good. They don't they don't die. They have a variety of different options within um, within their offerings as far as ones that if you only need to do uh, basic video, meaning you're not doing eight. Uh, 
you're not doing full 4K, you might be just doing 4K 60 or, or sorry, 4K 30, then you can buy at this price point. If you need to do further distance or high resolution, you can buy at this point, that kind of thing. And the other thing is, is that Kramer has a um, has a seven year warranty. But Kramer, for the most part, is an installation product. Theatrix, which is the brand that we're using for a lot of the different things here tonight. Uh, Theatrix builds an awesome piece that's significantly more money, still has a really good warranty, but you can drive it over with a Mack truck. And I'm not joking. Like you literally, you could, well, those of you who are here, you can come and take a look at them when we're done, but they really seriously, you can drive over them. They're crazy. Do we have another question or did we misunderstand the question? Uh, I think we, we're good, but we do have one more question from Derek here. Okay. Uh, and Derek's wondering if this is where we need to pay attention to the size of your switches. For example, if it's 1G versus a 10G network. Yeah, absolutely. So if you are, so the question is, I think, revolving around the uh, AVIP situation. Okay, so audio video over IP. Because you are sending a video signal and you are, you're taking that video signal and you're passing it across your network, then yes, you should be considering what kind of network you're, you're using. In fact, different brands and different models will have different requirements for the switch and that's something you should talk to a, a dealer or the manufacturer about. We're happy to talk, talk to you about that. Um, some technologies will use a different managed switch technology than what might be available in, in uh, just the switch you have already. So that's something to consider, okay? Um, yeah, it's definitely something that you need to be thinking about, but these days uh, getting into a, a higher bandwidth switch is important. Um, I'm not sure that we need to get into 10G for most of the things that we're talking about. We are having some discussions with some of our professional theater clients about going to 10G, but that's a lot. Um, unless you're going to be doing 4K video all over the place at four, like 4K 60 or 4K, you know, whatever, then you're probably you're probably fine under 1G. But you know, it, once you're getting to a building network or a, a bigger network, it's a good idea to have a conversation. And and I should say, you know, I, I started off saying that I am not a digital video expert. We certainly know more than the average person does about how this stuff works. But that's not to say that we are full on experts about everything in this stuff. And so when we're designing a larger system, then we will definitely get in touch with the manufacturers, have them involved in the conversation. And we will say, okay, this is what we wanna do. Our understanding is, is that this is how it's worked based on what we've done in the past, based on the specifications of this device. What do you think? And we'll, we'll come up with a good solution. Okay, thank you. All right, NDI is a specific brand of this kind of technology from New Tech. New Tech, yep, New Tech. And New Tech are the guys who came up with the TriCaster a number of years ago. And if you're familiar with it, the TriCaster is kind of an interesting box. It is essentially a custom made computer, or it was when they first came out with it, that had specific input cards and you could bring in SDI or HDMI into that, that computer and then use it for creating um, everything from your local television station's news report or weather report through to many churches and different theater groups, that kind of thing, we're using this as, a, as a, a video switcher and video broadcast device all in one box. Well, New Tech, uh, their TriCaster was very successful and they wisely said, AV over IP is a technology that's coming. We should embrace that. It gives us the ability to get out of the having to use these input cards into the computer if we are having a computer signal come into our custom computer, meaning having a encoded signal on a network cable coming in into the system, okay? So where that becomes really kind of interesting is that it means that you can now have a box that I'm gonna unplug this one because this one's not being used. This is an encoder, oh, actually, this is actually an X, pretend this was an encoder, but they look exactly the same. This is a box from Bird Dog, and it is a third-party manufacturer, and what they do is they take uh, HDMI input 
and they will convert it to NDI, which is Network Device Interface, and then they will send that out onto the network, and then it can be received into a computer that receives NDI, or it can go to an output device on the other end, and on the output then it, you're going HDMI out of that to any display or video switching equipment. Okay, So what makes NDI different than any of the other AV over IP things? Well, I already mentioned NewTek is the company that came up with it, and they have their own converter boxes and so on and so forth. I've now mentioned that Bird Dog is another company. Magewell is another company. This type of technology, the AV over IP, I said it's proprietary. NDI is less proprietary. It's a little bit more of an open technology that is used by a number of different people. That PTZ camera that I've got sitting over here on the stool, that camera will encode a, uh, NDI directly out of the camera. And then that NDI signal ends up onto the network. And now I can grab that off. I can go into my vMix computer. I can go into my OBS computer, into my live stream computer. I can go into any of those, or I can send that to an output device like this. It does many of the things that we talked about with AV over IP, but it does it in a way that is open and used by other by other technologies. There's also some interesting things you can do where there's NDI apps for your phone and you can take the output of your phone and stream it on a, on a wireless network with NDI to a system. Which is kind of cool because it can turn a cell phone into a camera as part of a live stream. You can you could do a variety of different things like that. You can take video from within a computer to within the computer, one app to another computer, to another app through NDI. You can send NDI from one computer to another computer sitting right beside it without any HDMI output and HDMI capture device. I'm just sending it through the network from one computer to another. Our church clients, many, many church clients are using this now for sending video between a computer, if you're familiar with, say, ProPresenter, Easy Worship, or Media Shout, or any of those types of, of softwares, and sending that on their local network to another computer so that they can do text overlay over top of their video. It's, it's pretty cool. So, oh, and it's also, it's inexpensive, flexible, and it's, gr it's growing. The, that whole concept is, is growing, and it, and it does really well. So what's the downfall? Well, we're going to get to that in a, in a second, okay? So just a quick overview of the things that we talked about. DVI is computer signal. It's got some, in, some industrial applications, backwards compatible with VGA, but it goes up to about 50 feet. HDMI is video and computer signals, okay? So it, it no longer is just computer. I've, I've never seen a Blu-ray player with a DVI connector on the back of it. Um, one of the disadvantages to HDMI that we don't talk about a lot, but it is a disadvantage, we were actually about 20 minutes, uh, 20 minutes, half an hour before you guys got here, experiencing exactly this problem. HDMI connectors are made to plug in to your computer, or sorry, to your TV, and then you forget about it, and you sit on the couch, and you watch TV. We take HDMI connectors, and we plug them in and plug them out all the time. And when we're doing something like what we're doing here tonight with all of these different things going on, there's a whole bunch of HDMI cables out here. I don't know how many HDMI cables there are here. At least a dozen. Okay? If I move around back there, it's very easy for one of these to come and get pulled out. So, HDMI is great as a consumer s uh, technology, but it can be a little bit frustrating for, for our business. SDI is great. But it only does video signals, so those 16 by, by 9 sorts of images. Doesn't do H, uh, HDCP. I'm going to get to it, I promise. And then uh, you can do a long distance. HDBase T can sometimes have a bit of latency. It depends. And for the most part, it can do anything that HDMI can do plus, And you can get some long distance. And NDI has network fl flexibility. It's cost effective. But there is some latency. Now, I've got a question mark in there about the 300-foot the thing. Any AV over IP technology has the ability 
to be redistributed many, many times over, mu over, over a long distance. The capabilities of a standard network is approximately 300 feet or, or 100 meters from jump to jump, from equipment to switch, or, and from switch to the next piece of equipment. But if you needed to send an NDI signal around the world, as long as you can jump from switch to switch, you can keep going from here to the moon. That'd be weird, but you could do it, okay? All right, so let's talk about this thing called HDCP. I felt like it was fitting to find a quote from Sony because they have their hands all over this one. If you do a search for HDCP, a lot of people online like to swear that this is the worst technology and that the devil created it. The reality is, is that what has happened is that when HDMI came out, the folks who built HDMI said, this is really great. We can send high definition video over up to 50 feet and it will look exactly the same from this device all the way to wherever it comes out. It's so good, it's not like that old VCR, you know, where as soon as it came out of there, it was not looking great. You could make an exact copy of any of the signal that you're sending out. So they said, well, we gotta stop that. So they worked actually with, I believe it was Intel, to create a security piece that resides on HD, sorry, on HDMI, and then any of the subsequent technologies that are associated with HDMI. Okay, it's called HDCP or High Bandwidth Digital Copy or Content Protection. High bandwidth digital content protection is a copy protection scheme to eliminate the possibilities of capturing digital content from the, the source to the display. It is designed to protect digital signals when using a digital video interface, DVI, and high definition media interface, HDMI. Did you catch all that? Their whole point is to stop you from copying it, recording any of that video signal, or streaming it because you do not have the right to stream that latest copy of the Star Wars Star Wars Star Wars movie online. You don't have that right. So they don't want you doing it. So they're going to stop you doing it and they've built it into the video transport technology. Okay? So how does this work? Well, it works kind of like this. There's a handshake the one side of it says the, the source, let's say it's a computer, let's say it's a DVD, Blu-ray player, whatever it might be. It says, hi there, are you gonna steal my video or are you a good person? And then the display says, no way, I'm not gonna steal the, your video, I'm good, I understand, I'm just going to display it. I'm just a TV. I'm just a monitor, I'm just a video projector. You're good, go ahead and, and do this. I'm not one of those bad things. I'm not a recorder, I'm not a streaming device, I'm none of that kind of thing. I'm just a display. So then the source device says, perfect. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna send you the video. Here you go. The display says, thanks, and then you get video. Does that seem fair enough? All right, so where does this start to break down? Well, I said that HDMI has HDCP built in right from the beginning, okay? Said that HD base T, right? The one with the Cat5, Cat6 shielded connector for long distance is essentially HDMI over a longer distance. Right? So in theory, it's all good. You should be totally fine. Because it's H HD HDMI or HD base T. Okay? I said SDI is not. 
SDI is a different thing. SDI is made for broadcast. If it's made for broadcast, there's no copyright material that's being produced. That's coming from a camera going out to a switcher. It's intended to be a technology to go to recorders. Does that make sense? So SDI doesn't even know what HDCP is. It's just going to say, well, I, you know, I, I don't know what you're talking about. When that handshake happens, if you take a DVD player and you try to convert it from the HDMI output to SDI, it's inside that converter. The DVD player, the Blu-ray player is going to say, hey, are you HDCP compatible? And the, the thing's going to go, I don't know what the heck you're talking about. I'm an SDI device. I'm broadcast. We don't talk about HDCP. That then goes back to the, to the source device, and the source device says, well then, if that's the case, I don't know, you could be stealing all of my content. Shuts off the output. And that's it. That's really handy. We run into this quite often. We ran into this earlier this week with a client. Because there's all kinds of ways that this can become a problem. So sometimes people say to us, we want to build our entire system in our school, in our church, in our theater on SDI. And we usually say the same thing every single time. Why? They said, well, it's inexpensive. We can run BNC cable all over the place, and, and it's really easy, and we'll just put converters on either end. Okay, great. That's fine. Will you ever, ever, ever want to be able to show a Blu-ray player or Blu-ray or a DVD or something like that? Or will you ever want to show some other streaming content or something like that onto your video projector or onto the different TVs around the room or around the building? As soon as you say maybe, then doing it with SDI is the wrong answer. Because as soon as you want to put something on that video network, on that video network, on that video system that's built on SDI, if it is a copyright protected uh, signal of some sort, then it's not going to get sent out there. It's going to stop. SDI, the technology, will say, I am not compliant, and the source device will shut it down. Does that make sense? All right. So what we often do in our systems is we will base systems for any video that is being sent out to displays or projectors. We'll do it with HD base T or AV over IP. Both are technologies that are HDCP compliant. And anything coming from a camera will often be SDI. Because what's coming from the camera into the switcher is not going to be copyright material, and we don't have to worry about it. Does that make sense? SDI is super handy to come from cameras. It's a not a great idea to go up to projectors all the time. All right. Now, again, this is the second time tonight where somebody pauses the video, goes on to online, and goes, how do I crack HDCP? There's ways to do it. They're all illegal. But there are ways to do it. Um, there is somebody who actually cracked the, the, uh, the code on how to do it. And it's released on the internet. And the group that put together HDCP basically said, yes, that's correct. That's how it works. And if you implement that into any of your technology, we will be coming after you. And we can prove that we know where you got that information from and know you're not allowed to use it. It's kind of like saying, yes, the keys to the bank are open, but we've got some cameras there and we're watching. <laughs> so if you go in and try to steal anything, we know sort of thing. There are ways to get around it. We are not going to tell you how to do it. We're not going to get involved with doing it. Um, it's not, it, the technology is supposed to work a certain way. And it's there to intentionally to try to protect us. 
So we have a couple of other um, things to go through here, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause for a second and talk about some of what we've got going on over here today. Um, this setup that we have got going on is kind of interesting because what we have taken is a computer. There is just a uh, laptop sitting at the back here and it is just looping the same video over and over again. I'm sure you're getting tired of watching this. Um, and it's going to an HDMI splitter. So it's HDMI cable, it's a short one, going into an HDMI splitter. Out of the HDMI splitter, we have, this is coming straight from the splitter going with an HDMI cable directly into the TV. Okay, this one, is converting from HDMI to SDI and then converting back to SDI or from SDI sorry to HDMI. This one is HDMI to HDBase T 50 feet of cable I think maybe 100 feet 50 feet I'm not sure I'm not sure okay back to HDMI to the monitor and this one is going HDMI out of the computer to a DVI encoder then it's going through a really really inexpensive network switch out of the network switch to a NDI playback device called the and, uh, bird dog play I think it's called so it is a it's a small NDI device and that it is back to HDMI here can you see the differences Which one is the biggest difference? The NDI, absolutely. Is it bad? <laughs> if you're gonna use it for a PowerPoint presentation, it's not bad at all. Um, so what's interesting here is that we are converting this signal back and forth, and you can see in the NDI that, that we've got here, I'm not sure if uh, people are able to see this on the live stream or not, but it's actually a little bit choppy. And I can tell you that that is not always the way it is in NDI. In fact, we had this set up earlier uh, this afternoon with a different, actually with this one, with a different decoder. And we were getting none of that choppy, kind of bumpy sort of a thing. But we wanted to show you something else here in a second. And we converted to a different decoder to see what would happen. And we're finding that this decoder, which is brand new, uh, like totally new product, we're seeing that there's a little bit more buffering happening. But I'm not, even, not sure that buffering is the right word. There's kind of like a stutter in, in some spots, right? I wouldn't say that that is indicative of NDI. What I can tell you is that it is something that you need to watch out for because it's proof that pulling an NDI box out of the box and just plugging it in doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work right off the bat. The other thing that we found with this, is, which has been really interesting, is as we've unplugged and plugged things in, the NDI one has actually caught up to the other ones and then fallen fallen back behind. And, it, and it's kind of interesting how that's, uh, how that's happened. And that is a lot to do with what that decoder is. Okay? NDI is not a perfect answer for everybody's solution, but it's, it's pretty cool. Okay, so HDBase-T, SDI, HDMI, they're pretty locked up. Like to the, to the naked eye, for the most part, when I was staring at them earlier, I would say that they're pretty close. We actually did a test earlier uh, and we might do this after we're done here and we'll show you again, but we had a clock running and we were down to thousandths of a second, is that right? three digits and we were uh, pretty close between those three like I mean really close between all of those three they're pretty locked on okay but the NDI was definitely de had definitely a bit of a delay I should say that the NDI network that we've got set up here is very very simple it's just two devices okay so there's nothing else in there that's uh, that's got the possibility of messing it up there are other reasons why you might want to go to NDI that could 
potentially make you say, I don't care about that potential of a little bit of uh, glitching. Okay? And I should say, there's lots and lots of people who use NDI without any glitching at all. And as I said, we did have very little to no glitching when we were using the other decoder. But, um, but again, it's gonna, it has, there's a lot of different factors. You're dealing with network traffic. All of us, I think, know that we download something one day and it downloads at this speed. We download it the next day and it comes at a different speed. Network technolo technology works that way sometimes. And we don't always know what else is happening on the network. Okay? So, I want to show you a couple of more tests before we move on to the next slides here. Um, well, uh, well, we've, well, we're talking about this. I'm going to flip a couple of things. So the first thing I'm going to do is this PTZ camera over here. We have, th it's kind of an interesting camera because it has um, an HDMI output, an SDI output, and an NDI output. Thank you. Um, HDMI, SDI, and NDI all at the same time. OK? And at first, actually, we kind of thought this might be interesting because we thought there's a good possibility that the control card in these may actually, or the output card, might actually be different. And what we found is that they're not nearly as different as we thought they might be. Uh, this is probably a good time to point out that all three of these monitors are all HP. They are, or all four of these, they're fairly close to being the same, uh, the same age and the same model. The smaller ones are of the same uh, lineup of mo of monitors, but they're just a, obviously they're different size. They're a, s a slightly different monitor. Um, so all I've done is I just turned on the camera there, and I uh, swapped out the cables on these these two displays. They should both come up there, and uh, we should see that there should be virtually no latency between those those two if we're just looking at those cameras. And then at the same time, that camera is now connected with NDI to the same NDI receiver. So that's an interesting thing that can happen with NDI is that I, uh, when Chris was setting this up this afternoon, he set it up so that the priority would be that camera over the other encoder. So as soon as that one came online, then it switched, kind of a cool feature, right? And so it's now it's now up there. If you watch and I clap, then you can see that the NDI is actually it's pretty close. Okay, so that is an NDI camera out of there going going up. Um, Matthew, do you want to just kind of maybe focus in a little bit tighter on the monitors here? And I'll just show that one more time while we're, while we've got it. Great. Okay. So if I clap, I should probably do this closer to the microphone. That would make sense, right? So it's, it's pretty good. Okay. So I think that really the point of that is that NDI is going to react a little bit different. You've got different types of, of um, encoders and decoders that are going to have an impact on how things, how things work. I should point out that the camera, if you want to get deep into this, and I'm not going to, but the camera is actually using NDI HX, which is a compressed NDI. And the converter that I was using to uh, earlier on that we were using to convert from the camera signal uh, to the NDI feed was not compressed. So, so it was using more bandwidth, which may have been part of the reason why it was uh, uh, lagging a little bit there. All right. Any questions? Okay. I'm going to switch back here for one more thing to show you, which is one of my biggest pet peeves and something that becomes an issue fairly regularly. 
when all this comes back up. So I mentioned earlier on that the NDI switched to the camera when the camera was turned on and it was connected to the network. Now what's going to happen is it's going to take about 120, maybe 180 seconds for the NDI to say, are you sure you're not there anymore? If you are there, then keep presen presenting video. If you're not there, then okay, that's fine. We're going to switch. Now it's going to switch out to something else. There we go. And we're coming back. Now what happened to my... Did I plug that into the wrong spot? What happened to my HDMI? My HDMI is gone. That's going to be a problem. There we go. All right. So we're back. We're back to where we were originally. So let's get back to my slides here. And now we are going to play the wonderful game of the HDCP game, Will It Pass Video? Um, that home video game that everybody loves to play. We play this game all the time. Matthew's at the back shaking his head. Um, we play this game way too often. So if I am taking a camera and I am going to a projector, is it going to pass video, yes or no? Yes, it is always going to pass video, or it should always pass video. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter which of the technologies we're using, as long as it's within, it's producing a resolution that's within the resolution of the projector. Then yes, camera to TV, yes, camera to video de recording device, yes, to streaming device, yes. Pretty much every single time, because cameras do not carry an HDCP copyright sort of thing. Wow, we've got Carl in the middle of the screen now. That's fantastic. If we have a, sorry, you can't see it. If you turn around and you see the monitor there, that's, hi. Okay, um, PowerPoint. If you're taking a standard computer and I built this PowerPoint myself and I am, I'm going to take it out, I'm gonna send it to a projector. Is it gonna work? As far as HD base, or sorry, as far as HDCP is concerned, it should work. It should work totally fine. I can tell you that occasionally, and I mean this is very occasionally, occasionally you can run into a situation where if you have a fancy video card, then the fancy video card might enforce HDCP even when you don't want it to. But on a PC, this is called foreshadowing. On a PC, if you have a video card that is forcing HDCP, you should be able to go into the settings and turn it off. Okay? So, PowerPoint to projector? Yes. PowerPoint to projector over SDI, if you're sending that 16 by 10 signal, it may get upset with you. So just remember that. SDI is only gonna work at 16 by nine, okay? PowerPoint to the TV, no problem. PowerPoint to recording, no problem. PowerPoint to, s to streaming, no problem. Streaming services. I wanna take my streaming service and I wanna send that to my projector or my display. If I do that over SDI, what's gonna happen? It's not gonna happen. It's not gonna work. And you think, but wait a minute. I opened up the power, or I opened up my browser, and I watched a YouTube video, and the YouTube video looked great. Everything was fine. I closed that that browser window, or I opened up Disney Plus on the same browser, and it stopped working. Computers are smart; they know what you're trying to do, and it won't it won't let you do it. Prime, Disney Plus, Netflix, you name it, they're all the same. Okay. Blu-ray DVD player, DVD, same deal, exactly the same thing. If you're going to a, a projector using SDI, it's not gonna work, okay? If you're going HD base T, if you are going HDMI, if you are going uh, AV over IP, it should work. Will it work with NDI? Well, that is a very good question. And I'm going to leave that as a, it depends, because there's some nuance to that. And it depends on what's on the back end of your NDI network. 
because it's going to depend on whether or not I am going to an encoder or whether or not I am going into a streaming recording device. It's going to depend. Okay? So that leads into the, the slide that I forgot to put here, actually. And that slide is what happens when I go from this thing? This is a Mac Mini. So a Mac Mini, it's just a computer, right? Right? <laughs> So I'm going to come back here. Uh, the Mac Mini is currently on, and I believe it's looping a video. And what I'm going to do is I am going to, I'm over here, I'm going to pull the HDMI cable out of the Windows laptop that I've got right here. I'm going to unplug that out of the HDMI splitter, and I'm going to plug in the, the HDMI signal that's coming from the Mac Mini. Okay? Does that make sense? So I'm going to pull the one plug in the next one. That's all I've done. I've just flipped that HDMI cable. And you can see that the, the one display is thinking about it for a second, trying to decide what to do. It's all coming up. And then it all gets upset for a second because the HDCP conversation is starting to happen. And then these guys come back and they say, no, 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 wait a minute. I'm HDBase T. I'm HDMI. I'm NDI, I'm your friend. You can go ahead and you can go ahead and send, send that signal and we're all good. And SDI says, no. Why? Any ideas? It's the whole HDCP conversation we just had. It's exactly it. For some reason, and uh, I tend to like to blame Steve Jobs, but I'm sure that it's not his fault. I'm sure that it was somebody else's fault. Somebody decided that Mac computers should always enable HDCP when possible. They figure, well, you should never be doing anything in nefarious, so we're just always going to, oh, we're always going to say that you're sending something copyright. And so here's the problem. When we come out of the Mac computer and we go to the splitter, the splitter says, well, HDMI, NDI, and HDBase T are all HDCP compatible. So you're good to go. Go ahead and send the signal with HDCP enabled. Even though this is not copyright material. This is a slideshow that Sam made. So there's nothing copyright about this. This isn't Disney didn't create this. Sony didn't create this. We created this, right? But the Mac computer says, well, if it can be copyright, we're going to go ahead and enable that copyright protection. HDBase-T, NDI, and HDMI all say, we're OK with sending copyright material. Go ahead and do it. The SDI output says, I, I, I don't even know what you're talking about. So it automatically gets shut off. Why? There's nothing that's an issue here. It's, again, it's not like this is a Blu-ray player or anything like that. But it automatically shuts it off. Depending on the situation and depending on the computer, you may be able to go out of the Mac straight into the SDI, and, uh, SDI converter and it'll output. You should be able to do that because the Mac should say, are you HDCP compliant for just the HDMI to SDI converter? And the device should say no. And the Mac should say, OK, you're the only one. We'll take note. We won't let you stream anything that's copyright protected. But we will pass the video the way that it sits right now. It should allow that to happen. But it doesn't always. 
Is this making sense? So Mac computers say it doesn't matter whether or not it is copyright, it's a, a copyright material. It says if you can support copyright material, we're going to put HTCP encoding on everything until you say otherwise. So two opposite ways of dealing with it. A Windows computer will typically say, in, with every single piece of content, should this be going HTCP or not for each content. Again, I said you could look up a YouTube video and it work, and then you start playing from Disney Plus and it doesn't because the Windows PC is dealing with it individually. The Mac computer will typically say new display is connected, are you HTCP compatible or not? And then it'll go from there. This can be very frustrating. It can also be very frustrating if you do what we're actually doing here. Because let's say you go out of this computer, you go to a splitter so that you've got a local monitor to see what's going on for your computer, and then you're sending the other one to a video switcher or to a recorder or something. Well, the monitor is HTCP compatible, so it'll just go ahead and it'll sen send it. It'll say, I'm HTC compatible, you're good, but the output to the SDI will not, and then we go to phone call. This doesn't work, this doesn't work, monitor doesn't work, the cable doesn't work, something's not working. That's what the problem is. Very frustrating. Let's just try that, just for a quick second here. I'm going to pull the HDMI cable from the Mac computer. I'm going to plug it plug back in the other one for I don't forget. And I'm going to plug this if my cable's long enough. It's not long enough. It's just long enough. So this is going straight into the SDI converter. Let's see if that actually comes up. I feel like we have a 50-50 chance. It's thinking about it. It looks like no. Okay? There is no reason why that computer shouldn't go ahead and output that. There's nothing copyright on that. I'm going to, just to be sure, I'm going to unplug it, plug it back in from the computer. But it should be taking that signal. It says it's getting a signal and it's uh, not working. Oh, hold on a second. Hold on. I'm doing something wrong here. I'm going into the wrong device. So one second. This is the part where on video it looks really weird because I'm running around all over. There it is. Great. So bypassing the splitter, going straight into the HDMI to SDI converter, and it works. That's the way it should work. Okay, but again, if I open up a browser on the Mac and go to Disney Plus, it'll definitely shut it off. Alrighty. You'll all you, some telltales about HTCP being the issue. Remember when I switched that, all of the monitors came up one at a time because different handshakes were happening at different times. They all came up and then they all went out and then three of them came back. That is very, very typical. You will often see that. Sometimes you will see it where it just keeps flashing. It'll come up and then disappear and then flash and, and that'll keep happening. And again, we'll get phone calls and people will say, hey, Something wrong with my cables, something wrong with my projector, something wrong with this and that, and that's what's happening. All right. It is one of our least favorite things to deal with. We we'll waste a lot of time. So that is our really, really quick tour through digital transport for tonight. Thanks for sticking around for it. Anybody got any questions? No? 
Is there anything here that surprises you? Nope. <laughs> okay. Well, if you've got any questions, then please let us know. And if you are online and you've got questions that you'd like to talk through, then we're happy to do that. We're happy to uh, try to answer them however we can. I've already said this at least twice tonight. This is a technology and this is a subject matter that is very difficult to be experts in. We think that we do a pretty good job of it, but that's not to say that we don't have something to learn. In fact, I think there's always something to learn in this world. Um, so uh, that actually brings me to what's coming up next. So there's a couple of things that are coming up. Uh, first of all, I should say there is no resource stage for December of 2023 because nobody comes to resource stage in December. Nobody wants to watch me talk or anybody else talk in December. Um, but we will be back in January. And we actually have two things going on in January that I think are going to be interesting. And I don't have the dates for either one of them in front of me right now. I'm terrible for this. Um, but I can tell you that the first one is going to be the second... Uh, the second Tuesday in January, and that will be. D were, was anybody here for the conversation that I had last year with Kevin Frazier sitting here talking about lighting design? Yes, Matthew was here. Thank you, Matthew. Um, that is kind of an extension of something we started through COVID that we're calling the resource stage conversations. And the idea of sitting down with a professional from the industry and talking about how do they get into the industry, what do they do, what is their job actually like, that kind of thing. Kevin is awesome, and if you haven't seen that video, it's on YouTube, and I think it's on uh, Facebook as well. It's, it's not short, but it's really interesting. And it's, it's, you can scrub past the stuff parts where I talk and just listen to Kevin, that's fine. Um, there's some really good stuff in there. Um, so we are doing another one of those in January, and this is with Robin Cheeseman, and she is the technical director for the Stratford Festival Theater for the main theater. She is awesome, and she is a super fantastic person. And so she's going to come, and she's going to sit down, and we're going to hang out, and we're going to talk about uh, her job and how she got into this job and what it's like to be a woman in the industry and a woman in leadership in this industry and that kind of stuff. So that's going to be pretty cool. So she is here um, the second, I believe it's the second Tuesday in January. There is another event that we are going to be holding in January that does not have a date yet. We were talking about it again this morning. We keep having to change the date for a couple of different reasons. And this next session is actually going to be a... Uh, this this one piece is going to be networking for uh, churches and theaters. And the whole idea is talking about the basics of audio video networking for churches and and community theaters. So we're going to sit down, we're going to talk about the basics. We're going to talk about IP addresses, we're going to talk about VLANs, and we're going to talk about the stuff you need to know to navigate some of the stuff. It's not to say you're going to be an expert after a couple of hours, it's to say that hopefully you can understand kind of the things that you need to to get started. Okay? So two things coming up in, in January to keep and keep in the back of your mind, and we will get the dates out to you shortly. Alrighty? Thank you very much for coming good to have you and certainly if you want to come up and take a look at anything up here you're more than welcome to do that and we can show you around a little bit about how some of this works thanks for joining us online uh, if you've got any further questions you're always welcome to email us uh, at info at horizon solutions.net or sales at horizon solutions.net or carl at horizon solutions or matthew at horizon whatever you want to do any of those will get to us and we will try to help out and uh, we hope to see you soon thank you very much Thanks.